Johnny, who are we reacting to today? Jose Zuniga. Who's that? Teaching men's fashion, he's called. He's a fashion YouTuber. Are we that desperate for views that we need to use fashion YouTubers nowadays? Before we get stuck in the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel now! So today, boys, I'm gonna show you every single piece that I have in my necklace, bracelet, ring, and watch collection. I don't care about your breakfast uh, bracelet. Necklace, ring, I don't care. Jewelry is boring. So I guess let's start with the necklace. I love... All right, can we skip this, please? Skip, skip, Imagrada forward. Let's move to watches. See, watches, watches have my heart. So this one I'm a, I'm a little bit of passionate about. So let's get started. He's passionate about watches. I like it. So I'm going to start in order of watches that I've purchased. And the interesting part is that every watch... I see an AP already on that stand, right? There's an AP there. Because he's going to talk about the AP later, probably. At least the ones that have sentimental value, they mean something. See, if you're an OG, and I'm talking about five, six years on this channel, you'll remember this watch. This was the first watch I've ever purchased with my own money. I think it cost me about 15 to 17 bucks. It was used off of eBay. It's a Timex Weekender. The Indiglo. That's the Timex Indiglo. The dial glows up. It's quite cool. I don't use it as much, but I never get rid of it. I never throw it away. I always keep it in my watch collection just because, again, I, I think it's special. It was my first watch. It kind of started the bug. You do need to replace the battery, you know. I've had it for now probably six years. I just have to replace the battery. It still works. But then I got into luxury watches. See, luxury watches for me, it's more so of a trophy more than anything. I promised myself that I would never just waste money on fashion watches unless it made sense for a goal that I was setting. This is a Yacht Master. Can't remember the reference number on this. Luckily I can. Five digits, 16622. There's actually an incredible story behind the Rolex Yachtmaster, which was introduced in 1992. But was it introduced in 1992? Because there have been early Daytonas from 1964, 1967, 69, have been seen with the name Yachtmaster on the dial. But the version that we see here was introduced for the first time in 1992. It was introduced in yellow gold and it was supposed to be a Submariner counterpart, but then with a more luxury feel. Like the Submariner was to be shown on Underwater, and the Yacht Master was to be shown above water. And that's why it was called Yacht Master. In 1994, they also introduced a mid-sized version of this, really, really directed towards the Asian market. In 1994, they introduced a 35 millimeter version as well. I have no idea why I'm doing this. In 1999, Rolex introduced the version you see here. It was a watch that was made out of full steel and platinum. And Rolex called that Rolosaur. It was a combination that Rolex produced themselves. Now this version is completely discontinued and they don't produce this anymore. There's two different variations of this exact watch available today, however. The new reference number 126622, one with a rhodium color dial, similar to this, but then sunburst, so it shines, and a blue color dial, also sunburst. Beautiful watch. Like, I love that Rodin Yachtmaster. I think the Yachtmaster is a very underrated watch. Bar the Yachtmaster 2 because that, that's just a horrible looking piece of shit. This one, but it's a Yachtmaster 1. It has the platinum face and dial. I was in love with this watch. So this watch, I believe at the time, cost me about six grand. I want to say that they're going for eight to ten right now. And this one was to signify my first milestone. So at the time I was 19, I believe. I would say he's correct about his pricing, yeah. 19 or 20. And I had just crossed the six figure mark in the business. So I was like, all right, cool. I want to buy something that signifies that. It's still kicking. This is a watch that I'm definitely going to be able to give to my kids. And it's a watch that really signifies that moment where I went from a kid that was broke to a kid that was actually making some sort of money. Ever since then, every time we hit another milestone, we would buy another watch, which brings me to one of my grails. This watch was one of those watches that you just never thought you would ever buy because you could never afford it. Audemars Piguet Royal Oak. My Audemars Piguet Royal Oak 15400, previous gen of the 41 millimeter Royal Oak on the bracelet. This was one of those grail watches at the time. I got this one 2018, I want to say, 2017, 2018. So I was probably 22 at the time. A watch that was discontinued about a year and a half ago and replaced with reference number 15500 with a different dial and the case is a little bit thicker. It's actually a more robust proportionate watch. I actually like the sleeker design of the 15400 to be honest. Although I 
do prefer the Dow of the 15500. A watch that is known as the single watch that saved the Swiss watch industry in 1972. Some people call it the quartz crisis, other people call it the quartz revolution. It was the introduction, the era where cheap Chinese battery powered movements were introduced. Oh. AP went into a different direction and introduced in 1972 a very expensive automatic sports watch in steel. The watch was more expensive than their gold counterparts. That watch really made a big impact on the Swiss watch industry. It saved AP at least. Several other brands followed in 1976 with, for example, the Patek Philippe Nautilus. I can luckily say I bought it very close to retail, if not at retail. And the beautiful part with watches is that if you buy the right ones and you're lucky enough, they actually appreciate. So these watches are going double, if not 2.5, what the retail price is. So right now they're crazy expensive. The market's insane. But I was lucky enough to get it at the time. That watch was indeed going for two, three times retail. At the moment, that's not the case. It's going for about 1.5 times retail. And I would say that the watch is worth about $40,000 today. The next watch that I got was a Patek Philippe Calatrava. You can just say Calatrava, mate. Just Calatrava. You know what Calatrava actually is? No. I do. Calatrava is the logo of the Polish army. Patek, Mr. Patek was Polish. Just look at that watch. Look at that. It's so simple, so subtle. And uh, one of the things that I love about watches is when you can find a watch that ha holds its value and also is not in your face. I like Rolex, don't get me wrong, but one of the downsides to Rolex, in my opinion, is that everybody knows, right? So when you wear a Rolex, I feel like it's, it's similar to driving a Lamborghini. You just feel like a douchebag. I, I almost feel like it's like people feel like you're showing off. I don't know if it's just me, but that's how I feel. But when I wear this one... I know what you mean. I have that with my Ferrari, but I do enjoy that as well because it, it fills up that wee gap in my insecurity and my ego. Most people don't even know what you're wearing on your wrist or how expensive it is. So I always wanted a nice dress watch, something that you know I could wear that's not a steel because I love steel watches. So a very simple, very elegant, but yet also boring watch to be honest, but I completely get where he's coming. We can't argue about taste. This is not my taste. And I think a small seconds on a Calatrava is a bit of a boring complication. The story behind it is cool and I know what he's saying, but he could have gone a different route with some cool complications as well, but maybe he has them. I personally would have gone for the Patek Philippe Calatrava reference number 5119. The dial is very similar. The complication is identical, but the bezel, the bezel Bezel lives a little bit more. I love the history of that reference number as well. There was a smaller version that I would highly recommend to you, Johnny, because you have skinny and small wrists. The most affordable Patek Philippe for people with a skinny wrist. Reference number 3119. You can buy them for about six, seven grand. Johnny, another watch that would suit your skinny wrist is the new limited drop by IFL Watches. The Midnight Sky and the Arctic Sky. These concepts are based on the 35 millimeter Tissot PRX. IFL has done a drop with the full size PRX, but now also with the mid size PRX. Both are very limited. The full size PRX drop sold out very, very quickly. So you need to be very, very quick with these mid size ones. Every single watch is hand painted and that makes every single watch unique. Make sure you do not miss out on the new drop. First link in the description. My next girl watch, boys. This one was the watch of watches, right? If AP was the watch that I thought I could never get, this is the watch that was like, I'll probably never buy that watch. Just because it's so ridiculous in price and so unattainable, I, I didn't think it was doable. Does the owner Richard Mill? The Patek Philippe 5712. So, oh, okay. Honestly, I just wanted any Nautilus. I just like. Love the 5712, but it's not very far off the price of your AP, to be honest. Nautilus design, mainly because I fell in love with the AP Royal Oak, found out about Gerald Genta and how he designed multiple watches, and the Nautilus was another one. I fell in love with the design. I love stainless steel designs. I love how rugged they are. So I wanted a Nautilus. If you know anything about watches, Nautiluses are impossible to buy. That's however not stainless steel. Does he know that? You cannot buy them for retail. The waiting list, depending on the model, can be from three to 10 years long. So pretty much impossible, which leaves you the alternative route, which is buying it secondhand. Secondhand, you're paying up to six figures plus. Not for this watch anymore, but if you want to buy or sell your watch, go to prideandpinion.com. That watch is not going for six figures anymore, by the way. Can I just point that out? And that watch is made in white gold. That's a white gold Nautilus. That's a white gold Patek Philippe Nautilus 5712. I find it really weird why we call white gold white gold, because it's actually not white. It's actually gray. If you compare white gold with, for example, platinum, you see a big difference. Platinum is white. White gold looks gray. It should actually 
be called gray gold, to be honest. But there's a cool thing about gray gold or white gold in this case, because there's a reason why it's so gray. It's because of the usage of rhodium. But also rhodium makes white gold to be the least scratchable precious metal on the planet. So it is also one of the strongest precious metals on the planet, stronger than platinum. For base models, which is ridiculous on a stainless steel, um, so that was that watch. I thought, you know what? It just is never gonna make sense. But it's the watch that I wanted to buy for my third milestone in the business, which we crossed in 2019, believe it or not. Luckily, I was able to develop this relationship with Patek. So I've had a relationship with Patek now for about a year and a half, almost two years, because at the end of the day, Patek doesn't- And there the truth is coming out. And that's the reason why he has this Calatrava. He's a good talker, mate. He's a good talker. He's a good bullshit. Right, I like it because he wanted a Nautilus and his AD forced him to buy that piece of shit Calatrava first before they allowed him to buy the 5712. Jose has been properly done in the bum. I don't want to sell to anybody that they believe are resellers or they're just in the business of buying a watch and reselling it. And I'm not in that business. I'm really in the business of buying a, a watch that I love and then handing that watch down to my kid and telling them the story of what it took to get that watch and why I bought that watch, right? Love it, love it, love it. Absolutely amazing, well done. Every time I look at this, I smile. Every time I put this on my wrist, I smile. Just cause it just seemed like that impossible watch equal to how impossible the goal that I had in the business was. So I feel like it's just like that perfect watch that every time I look at it, it just throws me back. I really hope this is not turning to be a very boring video because I literally have nothing to slag him off with. I just don't have nothing. I don't have ammunition. After that, I'm gonna be honest with you, this is a guilty play. I shouldn't have purchased this watch. I just shouldn't have. But I've always loved this watch. So this one has no goal, no marker, none of that. But Patek Philippe, because you were, because you were forced to buy that Calatrava, bro. That's why. <laughs> How he sold that Calatrava to the audience is brilliant. And that was to a Aquanaut 5168G. This is the white gold. So this is not the base, one up above the base model Aquanaut. So it's an Aquanaut in, in white gold. And this is similar to the Nautilus where it's impossible to get. Again, waiting lists are very long. Yeah, I don't understand that to be honest because it's a really boring watch on a rubber strap. Like, let's call a spade a spade here, right? That watch was going for six figures at a certain point. But the only reason it was going for that money is because a lot of people speculated on that watch. It has the name Patek Philippe. It is not mass, mass, mass produced. Of course it goes for a premium. Personally, I am not a big fan of the Aquanaut. I don't see the point of the Aquanaut. It's a really overpriced watch. It's only time and date there's nothing there now the last watch that i got is the rolex date just so when it comes to the date just there is only one option you can choose jubilee bracelet fluted bezel anything else it just it does not look good it correct i don't like the oyster bracelet on the date just i do not like the dome bezel on the date just the rolex date just was first introduced in 1945 they introduced this together with the jubilee bracelet the jubilee bracelet was introduced to celebrate the 40th anniversary of rolex it is a really really cool bracelet i love that bracelet and it should always be on the date just right i don't like the oyster the oyster is a sports watch it's a bracelet that belongs on a submariner on rocket watches Daytona. That's where the oyster bracelet should be. The Datejust was introduced as a more dress watch. A watch without a real function. Therefore, I think the dressier bracelet, in this case the Jubilee bracelet, is the better fit. I like his watch collection. I like the balance of his collection. He's missing vintage. That is going to be the next step of his collection for sure. All that was required to obtain this collection was money. Knowledge wasn't needed. With vintage watches, you need to do research. You need to obtain knowledge. You need to find the watch as well. That is also part of the joy of watch collecting. He's not there yet. 